What, what would you like for your great Australian detour? I'm going to guess it's something like this. Just a desolate beach on a stunning sunset. One of the apostles. Australia's most iconic coastal road. Well, what a coincidence. That's exactly what you're about to get. All of this and a whole lot more. This is the great Australian detour. I'd almost started to believe the romance of the open road was the stuff of legend. Not so. There is a whole new world of family memories waiting for you just off the freeway. People and places, moments to remind you that we live in a very special part of the world. Subaru's Great Australian Detour is a celebration of the long way. It's about taking some time to enjoy the drive, the fun, the stories, the mystery, and of course, the people we find along the way. Coming up on this episode, we take the Subaru Outback all-wheel drive touring on what may be Australia's greatest detour. Well off the beaten track, you'll find the Great Ocean Road. This road, this historic monument, takes you along the Southern Ocean riding huge limestone cliffs, past beaches to surf, through rainforest and pastoral land, beside a dormant volcano, and there's even a food trail. The Great Ocean Road is a living history, a place for stories to be heard and memories to be made. Here it is, the beginning of the Great Ocean Road. Technically, it begins a little bit further east in Torquay, but this is the spiritual beginning. It's over 240 k's of heritage listed road. It should take really, what, four hours to drive that far? But it's gonna take us a bit longer than that. There's a stack to see. Think of the Great Ocean Road as the sea change of driving holidays. Arguably Victoria's best coastline, this is the best road south of the Yarra. We're gonna start in Lawn generally under two hours from Melbourne, depending on the wrestle down the Geelong Road. To fully appreciate the Great Ocean Road, it helps to know how it came to be. Peter, the Great Ocean Road really is one of the great coastal roads of the world, isn't it? It is one of the great coastal roads of the world, uh, not only in terms of the feat of construction, but as a destination and as a visual monument, it attracts more people than both the Great Barrier Reef and, and Uluru together. Doesn't and heritage listed, so this must be one of the only, is it the only heritage listed road? To my knowledge, okay. it is the only heritage listed road. And it signifies its importance, mainly to the method of construction, the fact that it was largely returned servicemen from World War I that were engaged in construction. And in fact, the road itself is the longest war memorial in the world. So, and that's what a lot of people don't realise, isn't it? That it's, you know, it's 240 k's of, of war memorial. Exactly. That's exactly right, Andrew. Uh, people come under the archway at Eastern View. Yeah. And they think that that archway is the memorial to the returned servicemen. In fact, that's a memorial to a Major McCormick, who was the chief engineer uh, for the construction of the road. But the road itself is the memorial to the servicemen. How significant is the road as an engineering feat, given it was made by man and muscle and shovel? When you drive around the steep cliff areas of the road and think of the workers, the servicemen being lowered over the top of the ridge on a rope and having to cut their footholds with pick and shovel yeah. and then gradually dig the road into the cliff face, um, you wouldn't get away with it today. So when you're doing that beautiful drive, it's worth remembering it's, it's actually a lot more than a road. Absolutely. And where it takes you will fill your eyes and then maybe even your stomach. Polo Bay is your genuine seaside village. Your food options, pizzeria, there's burgers, uh, sushi, but I do know there's a fish co-op, which means fresh, fresh fish and possibly lobster fresh off the boat. So we should genuinely try and get one of those. Is that my ship coming in? I know, it's a trawler, but you get the idea. Trev, how long were you out for? Only two days this time. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. 
Wow. Hey, Trevor, when you're when you're out there fishing, you know, like say one night or three or four, do you eat them out there? Is that what you eat? Oh, once a year. You're kidding. Maybe twice at so the what most. Do you have when, what do you have when you're out there? Lamb racks, pork ribs. Do you? You seriously, you seriously don't eat them? I knew it. I knew it. You don't eat them? Not out there, no. What about no, the very... octopus? Oh, I love it. octopus at the restaurant. Yeah, right. I don't eat it out there. Right. I just give a bloke a couple the other day and he give me a couple of jars of pickled stuff back. Yeah. That's the way I like to do it. That's the economy. I'm working it out now. All right, good on you, mate. Thanks a lot. Not that I didn't try, with cold, hard cash, which clearly wasn't enough. Pickled stuff. I'll come back with pickled stuff. Cucumbers. Onions. There is a rumour that off-the-boat sales are coming back, so maybe next time. I didn't actually want the two kilo, beautiful, fresh lobster, half price that I could get it in a shop anyway. But what I wanted was a sandwich in a packet I can't open with white bread and plastic cheese. More Great Ocean Road after this. As you'd expect with Australia's most iconic coastal road, there's lots to see. And that's where Subaru's EyeSight Driver Assist really kicks in because you can use things like adaptive cruise control, which is brilliant. So it basically works like this. I turn on cruise control, I lock onto the car in front, and then I can set my distance from that car. So either close or further away. If they slow down, I slow down. It's brilliant and it's really safe and gives me a chance to actually enjoy what I'm seeing. The Great Ocean Road is clearly stunning. 70 metre limestone cliffs line the shore and whilst known as the 12 Apostles, only eight remain of the original nine. I know, it's a long story from the 1960s. I'll bet this place is many things to many people. Home to a million proposals and wedding photographs, family snaps and picnics, the stories that have happened here. And it is the shipwreck coast. There were over 200 of them. There's a feast of stories right there. It's like the beach, isn't it? From that Leonardo film. It's actually Lockhart Gorge on the shipwreck coast. And the reason it's called the Lockhart Gorge is the Lockhart, which was a clipper, came to grief out here and two people survived. One was the ship's apprentice, Tom Paris. The other was Eva Carmichael, an Irish traveler. And he survived under a, uh, like a rescue boat, woke up and then got washed in here. And when he got to the beach, he heard a woman's cries, arr, arr, like this. So he swam out to get her. It took about an hour. He brought her in, took her to a cave, found some brandy that had washed up, gave her the brandy. The two of them fell asleep and woke up and lived happily ever after. That's not true at all. The, most of it is they didn't live happily ever after. But this is where it happened. Phenomenal spot. We will find the truth shortly. But first, the cream we look forward to to top off any day at the beach. It's starting to feel as if every region has its own gourmet trail. So if you're looking for one down here, you're in luck. It's the 12 Apostles Gourmet Trail. And we've taken a detour off our detour to see it. The center of it is the village of Timboon. And they've got pretty much everything. We're gonna concentrate on the ice cream. Don't mind ice cream. You don't get ice cream from creaming ice, you know. There's a lot to it, and it all starts in the paddocks. Caroline, is the beautiful lush grass the secret to great ice cream? Absolutely, this is the key ingredient. This is where it all starts. If you've got good quality pasture, you put it through the cows, which are the grass harvesters, and then they produce beautiful quality milk that we can use in our ice cream. And your ice cream, Tim Boone Fine Ice Cream, mm -hmm. you're, you're all local, aren't you? Absolutely. We collect our milk from the local farm. We get our cream from Warrnambool Cheese and Butter Factory. We get local skim milk powder. So we source everything as close to home as possible. Have you had any disaster flavours where you, you and Tim go, oh, it's great. Why don't we do... Um, we did a Guinness ice cream once on request from the uh, local Guinness Irish beer. pub. Yeah, Guinness beer yeah. Uh, for St Patrick's Day. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. And that, yeah, that was a bit of a laugh, but... 
giving ice cream to people who've been drinking Guinness all day is not a great idea. All right, thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Andrew. Ice cream as it should be, from paddock to plate or cone at Tim Boone Ice Creamery. When we return, a conclusion to our soap opera. What did happen to Tom and Eva? Warrnambool is just over 250 k's from Melbourne and a winding, joyful hour or so from Tim Boone. It's definitely bigger than expected and is the largest town this end of the Great Ocean Road. How's your parallel parking? <laughs> OK, we haven't got long. Subarus have excellent visibility. It's thanks to the Subaru Vision Assist. So when you are parking, you go into reverse, your rear vision camera comes on, and then if you want to see the gutter, you press the view button. And that turns on the camera underneath that left-hand mirror, and then simply go on in. Because the one sound no one likes is <laughs> That's your rim scraping on the gutter. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> and if you do get too close to the car behind, you'll get that warning. And you'll know something's coming. Easy. So easy, I'd let my teenagers do it. Car parked, job done. I still can't calm my mind over Tom and Eva. What did happen at Lockhart Gorge? The answer may be found at Flagstaff Hill right in the heart of Warrnambool. Open daily, you'll find a faithful recreation of another time. It's fun, beautifully authentic, and volunteers like Lindley bring it all to life. L Lindley, this is a, just a brilliant living museum, isn't it? It's a, it's a much nicer way to see it. It is a fantastic way to see it because people, suddenly the young ones learn what things were like. Yeah and the older people get transported back. Oh, I remember. Oh, Mum had one of those. I know how to use that. Yeah, it's interesting in looking in the shops and seeing things that you actually recognise. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes you feel a bit old sometimes because you think, oh, whoops, it's in a museum. Yeah. But and I remember it. Yeah, it's a great way to do it. This is the shipwreck coast. Why such a difficult piece of water given that between Cape Hot Way and King Island, it's literally 90 miles. Yes. So it feels like a long distance for ships to come into, into trouble. Matthew Flinders wrote of this area that was some of the most treacherous waters he'd ever sailed. OK. And when Matthew Flinders says it, you know it's real. Lindley, how many shipwrecks on the shipwreck coast? 272. In, in what time frame? In about 75 years. Wow. The last one was in 1914. It's just an area that has a lot of currents running around it. So to have a shipwreck, you didn't necessarily need a storm. Yeah. You needed a navigational error, a strong currents, a bit of a wind, and then poor visibility because we get a sea mist come in yeah. and you can't see where you're going. The Lockhart, we stopped at the gorge. Beautiful, isn't it? It's, it is absolutely gorgeous. The story of Tom and Eva, tell me they really did end up together. No, no, no. Or what happened? Well, Tom did ask Eva to marry him because yeah. they'd spent a night alone, unchaperoned. But Eva knew she was a descendant of King Henry II. So no way was she going to marry a very poor apprentice sailor. Yes. Yeah. But there's a twist to the <laughs> tale. Because Tom is descendant of King Henry III and King Edward III. Right. Can I say you look stunning? Yes, you can say I look stunning. And I'll accept that. Lindley has told me that this is a, it's a slippery slope, isn't it? How many it outfits do you own now? Seven or eight and a couple more and the, the dressmaker started to make already. Right, OK. All right, well, thanks very much. That's quite all right, Andrew. All the volunteers dress up. It's what makes Flagstaff Hill so good. So you're the cannon master? I'm a bombardier. OK, My all right. My is a bombardier. Are we going to fire the cannon? No, unfortunately. What? We can't. <laughs> we, I need a crew of four. I'll help you. <laughs> and I'll I, get dudes. And I haven't got a charge made up. OK, but you can show me. Yes, I can okay, show you. OK, great. Let's have a look. Uh, if you step back a little bit, please. It's a 
be clear, you fire this cannon yes. once a month. Once, once a week. Once a month. Uh, in Queen Victoria's birthday week, we will be firing it every day, as far as I know. Wow. You do get the feeling Lee likes to blow stuff up, don't you? Mm. Lindley did warn me about the slippery slope of dress-ups, but I'm fine. We have more after this. Damn it, boy, I said mainsail! Mainsail! Oh, that is the mainsail. Fair enough. I'll be in my quarters. You might be surprised at what you find in Warrnambool, a former most livable city in Australia. There's literally everything. It's always nice to take something home from a holiday. You could get a sticker, you know, kind of stickers, stick that on the back of your car, Warrnambool, or here you'd go to the Fletcher Jones market. Now, Fletcher Jones, as you would remember, was a clothing brand. In 1948, Fletcher Jones went to America to study trouser design, and then he built this factory. It's no longer Fletcher. Remember the ads? The guys are standing like this. <laughs> it's now an antique market. So we're definitely going to find something to take home. And I thought Flagstaff Hill was a nod to yesteryear. This place is brilliant. Oh, look at this. It's a proper crock cooker. You know, like a... That's a proper crock cooker. How cool would that be? This is a genuine 1960s jumbo massager. Thought it was a toaster, didn't you? So I was warned, uh, bring a packed lunch. I'll never get that six hours back. <laughs> and I found nearly everything. Yeah, nearly everything. But this is what I will take. Okay. So the, yeah, the. Going straight down. I'm going to Port Ferry. Yeah. So no given point. Port Ferry is yeah. and two bucks each, right? Two bucks each. Yeah. That's fine. Fantastic. And Have a great game of golf. Yeah, thanks. And given Port Ferry's vintage, these will be perfect. <laughs> Tower Hills, just west of Warney and just east of Port Ferry. It's in the nation of the Gundich Mara people. The landscape is completely different to the surrounding area because it's an old volcano. As such, it's rich in both story and bush tucker. Paul, what country is this? Well, the country belongs to the nation of the Gunnismar people. Yeah. And that nation of Gunnismar people in this particular part of the country goes from Colac all the way down to Portland. Where I was born, I belong to the Gunnai Kurnai in East Gippsland. OK, and then, then this area just here, yep is also like it's a volcano. This is a volcano that erupted 37 to 36,000 years ago. Yeah. The last eruption was 7,000 years ago. So when people come here, they ask where the volcano, I go, well, that's the actual <laughs> volcano. So where we are now, we are walking right in the middle of the volcano. All right, and so when is it clear that it's not going to go again? After 10,000 years, we know the... Safe. Very safe. It's called dormant then after that. OK, so, so we're probably going to be safe. I hope so. In our lifetimes. Well. I hope it goes off to wake us up, but no, hopefully it doesn't, no. Paul's a natural teacher. Insightful, clever and very funny. Like, why do you call it bush tucker? Because it's from the bush, it's not from the supermarket. I to call it supermarket tucker. <laughs> <laughs> so the emu loves this one as well. OK. So it's like a cherry, eat the flesh and just spit the seed out. Certain areas, some will be more sweeter than others in certain times of the, of the year. And like I said, it comes and goes, no artificial colours and no preservatives. This is parsley, got Italian parsley. I know it's not. What's this one? It's a native celery. Wow. Oh my, mm. wow. The, it's flavor, like the flavor is very nice. It's exactly the same. And this is the celery again? No, this is, um, unfortunately, this is a hemlock. And I tell everyone, they think it's a, a parsley or whatever they think it is. I go, no, that's the most dangerous plant out here. That's a poison plant. So okay. It's not a celery, it's not a native. Um, and I believe if we show people the right and wrongs of the bush tuckers, yeah. because it's never too late to learn. 
And that's why I like working out at Tower Hill and teaching what I do for the young, younger generation and break down barriers at the same time. Yeah, it's good. Oh, it's great. It's really interesting. This one we call them similar to a, a grape. Yeah, a native, a native grape. Native grape, yeah. Comes and goes all year round. Like I said, they're sweet, nice and sweet. Yeah, and it's a grape. And it's a grape, yeah. And like I said, a lot of people walk past this every day, didn't realise what's available. And we can share this knowledge not only with our mob. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of international visitors that are coming to Australia. Yeah. We're getting a lot of multicultural people coming into Australia. We was very multicultural, we're still multicultural, but I believe we need to be one heartbeat together yeah. as a nation of people. Well, that's why we need you. Paul. No, the my best. pleasure. What Thank a you pleasure. very much. It's Loved been a great it. honor to see you too, sir. Really Thank good. Mmm. So, come out and have a good feed, ladies and gentlemen. Bush Tata. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is a revelation incredibly generous of both spirit and story. He left me with a riddle, which I'll leave for you. A woman rode up a hill and yet she walked. I still can't figure it out. Let me know when you figure it out. The further west I head, the better everything seems to get. Port Ferry, for all its seaside glory, is home to a different paradise. A true links course, seemingly in the middle of nowhere, it's like Ireland or Scotland in Victoria. This is how golf began, and it's how we must end. I had to come back. I had to come back to see if that last sunset would happen again, would be as good, and this one is possibly even better. So leave me here while I think about our next great Australian detour. I might hang around for the sunrise, because that might be, I'll come up with something. It'll be pretty good. Oh.